everyone, and welcome to Dallas Hoops FanCast, a podcast for Mavs fans. I'm your host, Sydney, and I'm here with my co-host, Martin. Hey, guys. You can follow the show on Twitter at Dallas Hoops Cast. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore Sydney Myers, and you can follow Martin on Twitter at Martin L. Myers. You're growing. You got a little, you have people growing there. You have followers and stuff. Oh, yeah. On Twitter, I got a total, I think, 35 or I something. I know. I'm Man, actually kind of shot. impressed. Yeah. It took me forever to get to like 100. Yeah. And well, you it helps have, to have somebody that vouching that already for you. Ha- yeah. yeah well, already and I, you know, you already have the community to, to yep. help out. Thanks, everybody, for following me. I know sometimes I say some really stupid stuff on Twitter. <laughs> Um, like you just when, you just got to get it out there. I just well, I'm new to the Twitter world. Yeah, and so you haven't learned. I won't finish my thoughts. <laughs> you haven't learned yet to just let things go. Yeah, it's like things. You it's like you have to respond to every single person that challenges you. I felt like I could have said all those things. I I probably said it better. Than yeah, you. <laughs> I will say Twitter is a blessing and a curse. Yeah, because it's awesome that you can communicate and see how people are feeling. But then at the same time, there's just some people out there that they say things and you're just like, oh, my God. You know? <laughs> and I haven't responded to any of them, so I'm not yeah. referring. And it's nobody really that's in our community. It's yeah. always this Mavs rando yeah. <laughs> that comes in and says something or like, dude, nobody's saying that. Just yeah. chill, you know, so. We didn't go to sleep until like uh, midnight last midnight. night, and we were both on the bed with I our know. phones and, and our it was faces. Crazy, yeah. like I was saying today, Mav's Twitter. It was on fire. Yeah, the whole day. Usually, I check it like I don't know once an hour, every half hour, but today it was just constant. It, like the conversation was constant. It's not yeah. usually like that. So what happens when you lose to the bricks? I mean, I'm like, it's like we were saying earlier. If you lose to the Knicks twice, twice. in a week. I don't think there's any sort of reaction that is like unreasonable. Now, now some people take it too far with like the fire Carlisle kind of stuff. Well, yeah. But I think yeah. that sort of emotion. But fire Carlisle. I'm no. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I think that that sort of emotion is natural when you lose to the Knicks twice. Yeah. I think, you know, kind of where they take it is a little too far, but I can understand their feelings. And I think that it would be safe to say the Knicks won't sweep anybody else in the league. So you will be the only team yeah. <laughs> that lost all your games that you played against the Knicks. the Knicks. And granted, it was the Super Bowl for them, and it was the loudest, ru- most ruckus crowd I've, yeah. I've seen in a long time. Yeah, it was a, but, It was pretty crazy. So um, anyways, yes, that's the Twitters. And then uh, also... I think we, yeah, so I, th- I think we saw some game, or s- some things that happened in the game that have been kind of a pattern throughout the season. Yeah. And so we're going to talk about... Yeah, so, okay. There's a lot of crazy reactions, and, you know, I get it. Like I said, I think all of the emotions are warranted, especially if you've been a Mavs fan for a while. You start to see patterns, like, through years, you know, because it's the same coach, and he has the yes, same tendency. Yeah. So you start to see patterns, and I think that's why it just... You get more and more frustrated every time you see it. Um, But there's been five, or at least we noted five things that definitely need to be solved. I mean, however you feel about the coach or players or whatever, like there's some issues that need to be worked out. And so we're going to go through those. We're not saying fire Carlisle or trade all these players away, but these are issues. No coach is perfect. I Like I said, these are things that they need to figure out. And I'm going to say you know, like go figure it out now. Yeah. Like that's, yep. that's your job. Okay. So the first thing that, and this is crucial, I would say this is number one, they have got to figure out how to get Christoph's Porzingis integrated into the offense. And like, part of that is how do we get him going and, you know, like get him shots where he's comfortable. But also part of that is just how do we make him a part of the of the offense? And you know, like it's so funny because they say or Carlisle says they don't really run plays anymore. It's more just about action. Yeah. But then it becomes the same thing. It's like, okay, so is he part of the action? <laughs> like, is there yeah. action run for him? Like, whatever you want to call it, it's not just about, okay, let's get him 15 shots a game. It's like, how do we get him a part of what's going on? Yeah. And uh, Carlisle's real big on balance. The whole team needs to be balanced. And sometimes I feel like he's afraid to, or not afraid. I I don't know what his feelings are, but he he, has no fear. He he doesn't, 
put the offense more through Porzingis because it might take away opportunities from the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. And to me, that kind of, I don't like, obviously, because your best players need to have the most shots. And the other guys on the team right now, first of all, whether we think they're good role players or not, they're not playing very well right now. And, and we'll get to that. Yeah, so yeah. You, you don't want to take shots away from Porzingis when you can give him more shots. I don't care if he shoots 25 times a game. I'd rather him shoot it's 25. It's not even about that. No, it's, it's just, just he needs him and Luca need to be the primary focus of the offense. So right now it's Luca and everybody else, and yeah. then Porzingis is trying to pick and choose where he can – get shots from and really he he should just it should come naturally to him yeah it's a you know it's like one guy was saying um on the twitters yeah on the on the twitters that they're they're, they have the number one offense and and for whatever things that we see that are going wrong they have the best offense so you know do you want to risk screwing that up just you can get porzingis involved and so and i think that that is a valid point i mean they do have the number one offense even with porzingis struggling this much but like you said your two best players have to be on it. They have to be dynamite because yeah. in the long run, that's what takes you over the top. That's, that's what's what, going to win you games. Yeah, that's yeah. What, that's what helps you to win close games, big games, playoff games, going further and further down the line to championships. Like you, you have to have your superstar players going. And so maybe right now it's easy to say like, well, we have the number one offense. Let's not. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix, don't fix it. But in but the long broke. run, yeah. <laughs> well, like just in the long run, it's in their best interest to find a way to get Kristaps going. You know, it's amazing that uh, the stat shows that the Mavericks have the number one rated offense. But when I'm watching them, I don't feel that way. It's just I feel Luka. like they're struggling. I think it is all yeah, Luka. like they're missing open shots yeah. all over the court. They're shooting YOLO shots. You know, just <laughs> woo. You know, like, yeah. I don't know, like every That's shot a is a, is a game that, winner yeah. type shot. And yet they have the number one offense. I feel like they're struggling to score out there. They go through yeah. long stretches of time where they can't get anything to fall. Yeah. So it... That's well, where Porzingis ma- would come in yeah. and, and Luca. like right now Luca's carrying the entire load of the team. But having two guys is, is to help mediate that. So that mm-hmm. way, like... Portland, for example, against Denver last year in the playoffs, Lillard wasn't playing very well, but McCollum helped them win that game seven. That's the point of having two guys. Yeah. And so you got to find a way to make sure that these are the two guys. They're all stars and they are leaders of the team. Yeah. Well, and they're going to, they're going to step up in those big moments, but you have to get them in rhythm. Um, You know, you also brought out, and there's a lot of things that that fans want to change. So like, for example, they want more pick and rolls with Luca and Porzingis. And, you know, we talked about what Carlisle, like he answered that question. Why don't we see more pick and rolls? And it was because he said it was because teams will switch and that can lead to an ISO situation. And we already like that was, you know, in the last episode, we talked about why it just doesn't make any sense. I don't think that makes sense, but you know, that's the reason for that. You also talked about him playing the five, yeah, that would I, help him to be more effective and and be a, a more uh, a larger part of what's going on on the court. Yeah, I just think that him being the five, first of all, helps him on the defensive end as well. Yeah, because he, I guess, he wants to play the four. I don't know, or the Mavericks want him to play the four. I kind of believe that they want Dwight Powell to start. Like Rick Carlisle wants <laughs> Dwight to take hold of that role and yeah. run with it. He wants Dwight to be better than he yeah. is. And so I think with Porzingis playing the five, it'll keep him in the paint. So some of these defensive struggles that the Mavericks have in he, protecting the paint, that yeah. Dwight is just getting absolutely destroyed. Yeah. And uh, I think Porzingis would be able to help with that a little bit. But offensively, I I don't know if the five helps offensively so much as it just... Well, if instead of Powell as the five doing yeah. that pick, that action, it would be Porzingis rolling. And, yeah. and, and you know what? Uh, Sorry, go ahead. We'll save this part for the rotation piece because I have yeah. a lot more that okay. goes along okay. with KP being in, in the mean, five. I mean, the bigger point is just there's a lot of things you could do. You could play yeah. him at the five. Yeah. You could run more pick and rolls. You could just change the offense to where it's he's just a part of it. And I think they will. 
ultimately. You have to. The problem with uh, Carlisle historically is that it takes him so long yeah. to finally make a change that to everybody else, and I know, look, there's a lot of people on Twitter that just just stop giving your opinion, <laughs> but there's also a lot of very smart people. Now, are any of them head coaches? No, but that doesn't mean they're not smart. And when the majority of the people on Twitter are saying, hey, why are we doing this? And even analysts are coming on, so-called experts. I don't understand why we're doing this. Yeah. At what point, when is Carlisle wrong? And so usually what happens is after about 15 hair-pulling games <laughs> of seeing the same thing, we finally get a change. So I think the Mavericks will adjust to where Porzingis is a primary offensive weapon, and, and his rhythm of the game is so much better. But I think we have a couple more games of misery before yeah. that happens. And it's I think that's what leads to the slow starts by the yeah. Mavericks. In the past, I th- whatever, five seasons, they've had slow starts. And, of course, right now they're six and five. But, like... Carlisle is historically... Yeah. Historically. Like, his first season with the Mavs, they started two and yeah. seven. Well, and I think it's because... He ta- he has a plan, and then like for whatever reason, I feel bad. The, the plan never works, but it takes him so long to adjust, and it's yeah. frustrating yeah. because it's like, you know, other teams they just they start their season and they just play, you and do then that's the who they are for that. Yeah. This you know, whereas with the Mavs, we gotta wait twenty games just yep. to figure out. And then when they do, know, they're really they're good. really good, and it's like, it's why just... didn't you just? And it's always the obvious thing, like. Last year, Luca, game one, we realized he was like dynamite, but it took 20 games before he was actually running the offense. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's these obvious things like that that's just, yeah. So, like you said, I mean, I think they'll figure it out, but it's going to take, gonna a take long time. time. Yeah. And the other thing is, Porzingis is coming back from the torn ACL. And I don't know how much of this is offense and coaching, which I think that's involved, but I don't know how much is also the injury affecting I mean, him. I know you're really proud of your uh, your prediction, but I just, I think it's too early to say whether or not that's the way it's going to be. Right now, that's the way it looks. But yeah. when you watch the games, it doesn't look like it's so much a Porzingis just missing shots, which he is, but it just looks like the overall function of him on the court doesn't look right. And I think that's more of a issue with him being in a new system with a coach that actually knows how to coach and uh, trying to figure all that out yeah. more than it is his knee. It could be a coincidence or it could be, you know, cause that was based off of what other players had done. My prediction. Yeah. So it could be that all those players, they had been out for so long that they struggled to Get the remember, yeah. like, yeah. oh, where do I need to be when I'm off the ball? Or, you know, like Porzingis was saying, how players kept slapping the ball out of his hands, you yeah. know, like things like that. It could be the offense. It could be a coincidence. Could be both. Yeah, it could it's, be both. Yeah. I, I think it's both. But just because I think the injury is playing a role does not mean that everything else away is off from, the hook. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that they do need to figure things out with you'd, the offense. You'd rather lose with your your two best players playing dynamite than losing when your best player yeah. or one of your best players really struggles. Yeah. Well, okay, so that's and that kind of goes into the second point. Um the second thing that they really need to figure out is they're their role players. And like honestly, I don't even know if there is anything to figure out here because JJ. The, well, but the thing is, I'm starting to think, and I think I've said this recently, like, I'm starting to think that this roster just isn't that good. Because we talk about Hardaway and Brunson and Finney Smith and Dwight Powell and Curry. It's like, well, you've just listed like 75% of the roster. You, like, you, even if you played uh, Berea more minutes, that's one player. But not really, because Berea elevates. Everybody Those else? other guys. Okay. Two years ago, Berea, Curry, Maxi, and Powell all came off the bench. They had that mob squad, mm-hmm. the Mavs off the bench. And that was their best lineup. Really. Yeah. I mean, and, and Curry played better off of Berea. Powell and Berea have a great connection. Yeah. And Maxi and Powell were great defensively. And and plus they balanced each other out. And they were going against second unit guys. And that second unit with Berea is so much better. So in a game like in New York, 
You have Berea out on the court. He's he's the calming factor. He's able to to calm everybody down, run the offense, make plays, get them easy dunks. Berea is the one that helps improve the rest yeah. of these role players, and I think that's kind of what they're missing right now is that guy, that steady hand off off the uh, off the bench. Yeah. And I know it's just one guy, but he impacts when when like I've said before, when Berea is on the court, he plays like an all star. Yeah, I think, well, and also that made me think, you know, a lot of times these guys, they 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 don't step up in big games. Um, we saw that the first time against the Knicks, this time against the Knicks, um, against the Celtics, I think they all struggled. Yeah. Like, aside from the game against the Nuggets, which now is It was looking, an anomaly. Yeah, which yeah. more and more looks like an anomaly. Their role players have really struggled to step up. But to your point, I think if you had a, a veteran out there like Berea, who is a big time player? He yeah. kind of you like everyone else feels a little more comfortable. The know? only thing that prevented Berea from being a multiple time All Star and a Hall of Famer his is height. his size. Yeah. yeah, he's just small. If he were six three, he would have been top five point guard in the league. Yeah, and I don't. You can argue with me on that all day. You you've seen it on the court when he's out there, he's unstoppable, and especially when he's feeling it, when he's yeah. got it going. Well, and now that he's in his prime, yeah, is yeah when he was yeah so. In my opinion, and I, I know people are like, well, but you can't bench Brunson. I like Brunson, but let's think about this logically or really. I don't want to be condescending, <laughs> but we're talking about a second round pick. A second round. How many second round picks have ever developed into a serviceable player? Most second round picks don't even, Aren't even in the league anymore. Exactly. Yeah. They don't even make the team or they're in the G League like Isaiah Roby. Now, Brunson has been good, and he made the team, and he had a really good rookie year, but you're still talking about a second-year, second-round pick. Yeah. And we're sacrificing wins to develop that guy. That's why Beret is not playing, because they don't want to sit Brunson, and I think that's a mistake. You know, it's funny. In the past, I've complained so much that Carlisle doesn't develop Young, players. Yeah. But... Now it's like it's almost like he's gone to the complete opposite end of the spectrum because he has stuck by players like Dorian Finney-Smith and Dwight Powell, who these guys have not improved. I mean, Dwight Powell, they're, maybe they've improved, but they're just not good enough. Yeah, they're still make, not yeah. good. But they like Dwight Powell is now starting. He used to come off the bench. Sometimes he was only a garbage minutes guy. Uh -huh. And now he's starting, and he has not improved to the point where he should be starting. It's just simply because through progression, they made him a starter. And Dorian yeah. Finney-Smith is sometimes starting, and he just he has not developed into the player that they want him to develop into. And it's like, Carlisle, he, now it's like he's the opposite. He just sticks to these guys mm -hmm. because he's hoping they'll develop. And Brunson, this is like he just started struggling. this Last season, he was great. So it's not like Carlisle has wasted a lot of time on it. But well, another thing that's hurting is the in and out of the lineup. Like last True. year, Brunson was basically thrown out there with Luca the second half of the season. And so he got time to play. He mm -hmm. he was in the game long enough to make an impact. Or as Derek Harper says, an impact. And this year the, the way the rotation is, it's you know, players are in and out so quickly. Yeah. And they don't really ever, and I think that's a, an issue with Carlisle is the, the inconsistency of minutes and just pulling guys, yanking them. Sometimes they're even playing okay, and yet they don't see the court again. Yeah. I, I do want to mention, so I, I, I Twittered something. You, you Twittered? What I personally think the lineup or the rotation should be. Oh, yeah. And my starting lineup, I had Luca as your point, DeLon Wright in there, okay. Justin Jackson, Dorian at the four, and KP at the five. I mean, Jackson hasn't even played, you know. Right. He's one of their best three-point shooters. I'm not a huge Justin Jackson no, fan. But, but he's what you have. For a team that wants to shoot threes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I've been saying. But they want the to whole shoot year. threes. It's like their three best three-point shooters are... Well, you, Seth, Seth, who's Seth, not shooting well this year, but we know. Wise, yes. Curry, uh, Jackson... And I think it was Maxi or something. Like yeah. those are their three best shooters. And Curry sometimes doesn't play. Jackson never plays. And it's like for a t whereas 
you know, if you look at the, and, and this is probably on, on point three, maybe a little bit, but if you look at the guys who take the most threes, Tim Hardaway is second at six and a half a game. Dorian Finney-Smith takes three and a half a game. Those are their two worst three-point shooters. Dorian Finney-Smith is shooting below 30%. Uh, Hardaway is 32 and they're combining for 10 three pointers a game. And I just, I don't understand like with this roster, I feel like Justin Jackson should be part of the in and out rotation. At least he's just yeah. given spot minutes every now and then, but I like him starting with mm-hmm. DeLon and Dorian. I want DeLon to start, but and apparently he doesn't want to. I don't Carl care. Out. And that's what I, I would, would tell say, him. What's best for the team yeah. is we got to try this out because people were talking about how DeLon and, and Luca just doesn't work. We did it one time, <laughs> the very first game yeah. of the season. And you're telling me after that one game, it is determined that they can no longer, they're not compatible. I mean, they have played together after that. They but, played together, but they didn't but they start. Didn't start. Together. Yeah. So to me, you go back to it and you try it for a whole season. Like, you just... Or at least five games. Something. Yeah. More than one game. And then, oh, he's not good in yeah. the starting role. De- DeLon with Dorian, Justin Jackson, Luca, and KP, to me, gives you a good balance of offense and defense. And shooting. And shooting. You need Justin Jackson right now. That center role of Dwight Powell is taking a spot in the rotation that by by somebody that can't do anything. Yeah. Dorian Finney-Smith is a better post defender than Dwight Powell. Dorian Finney-Smith is a good defender. KP yeah. is a better rim protector yeah. than Dwight Powell. Cut Dwight Powell. Well, <laughs> and that's the thing is, so, you know, talking about role players, like, first of all, I'm starting to realize that maybe this roster just isn't that good. And second of all, they have a lot of players that are really good at only one thing. Like Dwight Powell is really good at picking, setting a pick, rolling to the basket and dunking. Literally cannot do anything else, defense, rebounding or shooting. Dorian Finney-Smith is really good at, d- at defense. defense. Yeah. That's it. He cannot shoot or dribble. If he dribbles, if he dribbles turnover. it's a turnover. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, they have these players that are really just good at one thing, and I think that also hurts the overall talent level. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, okay, so Seth, throughout his whole career, has proven to be a very quality role player. Mm-hmm. Now, what I think the issue is they're just not put in the situation yeah. to help them. So that's my starting lineup. So my second unit would be Seth, J.J., Dwight Powell and Maxi Kleba with Tim Hardaway Jr. And I think because yeah. JJ and Dwight and Maxi have had great chemistry over the last couple of years, they just play well together, especially Dwight and Maxi. When they're together on the court against second unit guys, they're really good. And when you have Seth out or uh, JJ out there running the offense, he can determine who's getting shots. Did you say Hardaway too? Hardaway, yes. Yeah. So he would prevent Hardaway from yeah. YOLOing it out there. <laughs> And he would make help Seth get open. Right now, Seth, I, I don't know what the issue is, but it's just playing off of Luca. It's so strange. You think it'd be so easy, mm-hmm. but he's struggling with that right now. Yeah. So I don't know. But to me, that. Well, that, he's another one. Like I said, they have to figure out yes. Porzingis. They need Seth to also. Seth, got to figure yeah. out. And I think he's better served coming off the bench. And then that leaves the odd man out is Jalen Brunson. And I know it sucks. But I'd rather make the playoffs. I think making the playoffs are more important than trying to develop a second year, second round pick. Yeah. I mean, I've always thought, like, I don't want to, like, I keep saying, like, I don't want to give up on Brunson, but it's just, I don't want to kill his confidence. If that's, I feel like if we're talking long term, you do want to develop a player, especially if he can develop into, like, JJ Berea's replacement. But like you said, he's a second round pick. What are the odds that he's going to be a even solid a serviceable player? Yeah. Now he might, but the thing is, if that kills his confidence, then he's not going to be that guy. Because in order to be that guy, to make it in the league, no matter where you're drafted, you have to be confident. You have to continue to fight. Yeah. So no matter what the the odds are against you, you can overcome them. And if this 
kills his confidence and he falls out of the league, that's what he was going to do eventually. Or anyways. like you know, if they if they if they take his minutes away now, he's never going to get them back, and that's going to be that's like not the necessarily end of it. true. I mean, yeah. the thing is, you're developing him, and he's still under contract. You're going to have him next year, so this would be part of his development. He came in this year. He sucked. You work with him. You go again at it next year. Or maybe later on in the year if he starts doing well yeah. in practice. You, I don't know. Just to me, JJ is the type of guy that in a hostile environment... He would help. He would help. Okay, so that's the second um, thing. Second problem they need to fix. <laughs> the second thing. Yeah. <laughs> it is just, you know, like I said, it's their players. Like, I don't really know if there's anything you can do about that aside from you know, trades or getting different guys. Um, but there are a few things like maybe playing Berea would help not just with Brunson struggling, but also with that entire second unit. Maybe that would he help. He will elevate their yeah. play. But overall, I am starting to realize like maybe the roster is just a little more weak. You disagree? I just think it's too early to determine yeah. the strength I mean, of we the are roster. Only 11 yeah. games in. Yeah. Okay. Um, the third thing uh, I wrote down that they need to fix is, the offense and that's it's so weird it sounds yeah. weird yeah because they have the number one offense and, and i don't mean that i mean they don't need to do a massive overhaul but just my one little point here is that i think the wrong players are getting the wrong shots like i talked before about um the players that are taking the most three pointers for example hardaway is second on the team at six and a half Dorian Finney-Smith is getting three and a half three-pointers a game. You know, those guys are shooting, like I said, Finney-Smith below 30%, Tim Hardaway 32%, and they're take, they're combining for 10 threes a game. And the Mavericks as a team, how many threes do they take per game? I don't know. 39.5, and yeah. they make 33.8%. Yeah, so they take 43s a game, and... Hard, their two worst three point shooters are taking ten of them. Yeah, you know that's a that's a big chunk. That's of a the big three percentage. Pointers. Yeah. yeah, and so I think the offense creates good looks, which is that's the flow offense. That's what it's supposed to do. It creates these wide open three pointers. We just don't have shooters. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was you know maybe Curry in the corner there, or or maybe even um, Porzingis if that's how you can get him involved. He's gotten one yeah. corner three. Get this him entire some season. of those yeah. those three pointers. Delon Wright is actually he's shooting thirty five percent on three pointers. You know maybe just shift things a little bit to where the right players get the right shots. That's just one example of you know the three pointers. I think it's the wrong players that are getting those shots. Yeah, the the thing is with Carlisle is. And I don't know this for a fact. This is just what I've heard is that he is, and I, I saw it on Twitter. I, I wish I knew who it was. On the tweeters. On the tweeters. He is huge with the plus minus. Hmm. This Okay, so the the player with the best plus minus on our team right now is Boban with seven, plus seven. That makes sense. The next highest is Tim Hardaway Jr. with 6.4. The plus one after 6. that, 4. plus 6.4. And then right after that is Jalen Brunson, plus 5.7. Right after that is Dwight Powell, plus 4.9. Yeah. Who are the guys that keep getting minutes? Tim Hardaway, Those Dwight guys, Powell, yeah. Jalen Brunson. This is my problem with so-called advanced, advanced analysts, stats. Yeah. Because this stat is telling you... Well, this stat... Let me finish. This sorry. stat is telling you, you need to keep playing these guys. When you watch the game, these guys are struggling. Or they're shooting bad shots. They're not playing well, but this stat's telling you they are. There's something wrong with that stat. Yeah, I think, you know, I I use advanced analytics all the time, but you have to take, you can't just look at one. No. You have to take multiple numbers. It's just like when you're watching the game, you don't just watch one thing and think, oh, that, that player is good because mm -hmm. he's a good shooter. It's like there's so many things involved, and it's the same thing with analytics. You have to take so many into consideration, and you have to be smarter than the stat. you got to think about this. Like Luka Doncic, who everybody's saying is having a historical season for yeah. a second-year guy, he's dominating. He's at negative 0.6 plus minus. His, oh, it was plus minus. Yeah. Yes. So there's something wrong with that. You should not base who you play based on plus minus. Or just because, on that alone. Right, because yeah. clearly there's something wrong with that number. Yeah, and I mean, that could be why these are the players that keep getting 
these well, shots. if that rumor is true, yeah. and I wish, like I said, I wish whoever you are out there in the Twitter world who said that, that Carlisle's really big on the plus minus, it looks that way based on, if you look at the plus minus of the team and the players that Dwight Powell and Tim Hardaway, and we're wondering why is Tim Hardaway out there? When he's breaking shots, he's shooting YOLO shots. Well, and also Hardaway over Curry. So Hardaway yes. has a better defensive rating than Curry. Yeah. So that could be part of it too. Even though I never noticed Hardaway being a good defender, but it's it, you know. to me it looks like Hardaway gets destroyed. Yeah. So I, I I don't know. I mean Yeah, so I mean that's my thing with the offense is that it the system creates good looks, but it's the wrong people taking those shots. And and like I say this all the time about the flow offense. My my number one concern with it, and I don't want to say it's an issue because it does work for so many teams, but my concern with it is that its its point, its purpose is to find the open man. And it's like Sometimes that guy is open for a reason <laughs> because he's not a good shooter. You know, yeah. like it's different if you're the Golden State Warriors and you have five all stars or the 2011 Mavs that had solid players and solid shooters all the way around. It's different when, yeah, literally every person can shoot or score. But when you have obvious weak links offensively, the flow offense, it's going to find it. But not that's not a good thing and so that's that's my only concern with it is that like yeah it's creating these open shots but in this case that's not necessarily a good thing because those guys shouldn't be shooting like dorian finney smith i mean yeah. shooting below 30 percent and and hardaway who yeah i swear he like gets the ball and just says yolo in his head <laughs> and then like does whatever he wants so yeah i mean that's my problem with the offense um it's just a minor tweak and i think it it actually kind of goes to the third um the third problem that I think needs to get fixed. We're only on number three. Oh, oh no, no, this is the fourth. Oh, okay. This is the fourth. Yeah, <laughs> the fourth, and it's actually it's all kind of combined. But the fourth one is rotations, and so yeah. we talked about this a little bit earlier. Like this is all, it's all connected. Their role players struggle, and so their rotations maybe could be fixed, and then the offense, like those yeah. rotations, will also help the offense. But yeah, so point well, number and, four is the rotations, and and a big issue that a lot of people had in the last game with the Knicks, and really I, I've had for a while, well, this whole season, is the length of time that Luca and Porzingis sat the fourth quarter. Yeah. And look, we understand Luca cannot play 40 minutes a game. He can't he shouldn't even be playing 38 right. minutes a game. Now and I don't The argument I don't want could that. be made that you other know, players do it. They've but, done it. I mean, LeBron James used to average 42 minutes yeah. a game. He's now in his what 16th, 17th season. So clearly maybe it can be done. So either but way I get it if you don't want to. Right. But we're not saying that. The problem is there's gotta be some flexibility. And when you are trying to win a game on the road in a hostile environment, that might be a game that Luca can play a couple more minutes and will be fine. He's 20 freaking years <laughs> old. Yeah. He's 20 years old. So you playing him two extra minutes against the Knicks this one game. is not going to cause him to have two torn ACLs <laughs> in his fourth season, you know? Yeah. So it's just it's just situations like that where you need him. Now there's other situations like against Memphis. He didn't even play the whole fourth quarter. So you got to be balanced with it with it. We're not saying play him 40 minutes. We're just saying there's got to be some flexibility where you can play him a little bit more, bring him in a little bit early. And I think that goes with the entire team, the way the minutes are staggered. They're in and out, in and out, in and out. Yeah. Nobody really ever plays more than three minutes except for Luka. Or they, yeah. They, at, at one particular they time. They play five minutes and then and they then don't play out. for the yes. rest of the game. And yeah. it's that to me is is just... I don't like it. I know Carlisle's doing his mad scientist tinkering and all that. Um, I just don't think it's necessary. Like, it's just pretty do the basic. obvious yeah, thing. Yeah, it's pretty basic. Yeah. Like, you know, just do what's what's obvious. You don't have to reinvent basketball. Yeah, um, yeah. So that was, and a lot of people said, you know, you, well, you couldn't take Luca out early in the third. You know, like they're saying, if you want to put him in earlier in the fourth, you have to take him out earlier in the third, and you can't do that because he was on fire. And like, yeah, duh, he should we have get that. He yes. finished that. I'm saying in this particular game, 
you know, play him the rest of the third, awesome, sit him in the fourth, but just bring him in a little bit earlier yeah. just because of the situation. And people are like, but he's going to be gas. Look, for one game or just two one. games, it's yeah. going to be fine. Yeah. Players used to average 41 minutes a game, and they were fine. And I'm not even asking for that. You know, I'm just like... Just, just for the have situation. Some, yeah. some flexibility. So there's that, the the rotations, the minutes. Um, but I think also like which players are gonna play, are gonna start. Minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, for example, Berea, could he help the team right now? Delon Wright, I I really wish he would start or could start or whatever it is that's holding him out of the starting lineup. I wish it wasn't there because I think he could I would at least like to to try that. I mean, you know, I might be wrong, but I would at least like to try. No, I think they him need to with his, with Luca, and then Hardaway. Yeah. He's really struggling to contribute. Should that rotation change a little bit? And then it's like, okay, so we just talked about how the roster maybe is a little weak. Well, what's the other option if Hardaway doesn't play? So it's like, it's kind of these things. It's like it's, there's a little bit of give and take. There's only so much you can yeah, do. Yeah, and and like I said, I, I I'm not saying that Hardaway shouldn't play. I think Hardaway is a quality enough player in the league to play. It's just how are we using Hardaway? Yeah. yeah. Or why why is Hardaway the guy shooting our our shots in in a crunch game? Like in what part of Hardaway's history has proven that he should be the guy that's shooting yeah. these these balls after or in crunch time moments? And it's just you know that that's my thing, and and again, it's 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 all the advanced analytics, and like I said, with Carlisle, so with with net rating, for example, Hardaway's third at a plus eleven in what in oh, net rating. Oh, you said he had he was at six point five. No, that was plus minus. Oh, right, yeah. So net rating, he's third. Plus minus, he's second. Luca has a negative point seven net rating. There's something wrong with that stat. with this stat, or it's not telling you the full picture. It can't be. Yeah, there is no way you're telling me that when Luke is out there, your team is a negative, but when Tim Hardaway's out there, it's a positive. Yeah, there's the equation needs to be reevaluated. I mean, whoever it, the st- statistician is <laughs> that wrote this equation yeah. in Excel or whatever program they use. There's something wrong with it if it's telling you that your team is better with Tim Hardaway on the court compared to when Luka Doncic is on the court. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, it does, like, other players, like, who you're playing with impacts that. So, you know, like, for example, Luka and Porzingis have a negative net rating, mostly because Porzingis has not been great for most games this season. And so, I mean, like, it's impacted by things like that. And that's what I'm saying is, you have to be smarter than the stat. If you're Carlisle, you have to understand why it's saying. Well, and he this. had a positive net rating his last year with the Knicks. Oh, Hardaway. Porzingis. Or Porzingis. Yeah. So clearly, he can provide you. Yeah. Positivity. I just my problem is running a team based on advanced stats because this is this the advanced stats are telling you your team is better with Tim Hardaway on the court. Compared to when Luka Doncic is on the court. And then you keep doing it. It's like, why isn't this working? Why aren't we winning? Or why aren't <laughs> yeah. these shots going in? Well, it's because they're not actually... It's that, because he's shooting 30% from the floor. That equation is wrong. Yeah. Whatever it's telling you, it's wrong. And and that's why I don't like running a team based on these kind of numbers. Because that's why we get post-ups from Wes Matthews. It's why because you to bring that up every episode? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. Like When you watch it, you're like, this never works yeah but somehow in this equation that they wrote it says hey a post up for west matthews is the best is thing a you positive can do play. ever do it 20 times a game even though when you watch it's like he bounces it off his foot <laughs> throws it out of bound or just shoots a wild yeah. every now and then he makes it and and then it's like crap we're gonna go five now times we're in a row do this 20 more times so that's that's the thing with the advanced stats you know I, i'm huge i love advanced numbers but there are some that I think need to be reevaluated. You're running your team based on numbers that are telling you that these guys who aren't playing very well, your team is better with yeah. them on the court. Like it says, Dwight Powell's our fourth leading net rating at 9.3. He has been garbage. When you watch it, he can't stop anybody. Yeah, his defense. He's and, missing yeah. layups. Well, and that's actually so the the fourth point was rotation. Sorry, Just, I, I went on it. Oh, that's okay. Well, the, the, uh, the fifth point is de- defense, so that's why yeah. I was going to go on to that. Yeah. So the rotations, I think maybe 
there's certain players getting minutes that maybe shouldn't be getting that min- those many minutes or maybe shouldn't be starting, maybe coming off the bench. But the fifth point that, and this is obvious, they really need to fix is their defense because they have one of the worst defenses in the league. And I think, you know, like we said before, they have good defensive players. It's strange to see them have a terrible defense. Like Dorian Finney-Smith is a good defender. DeLon Wright is a good defender. Um, Kristaps Porzingis is a good interior defender. But I think, again, it goes back to how everything else is connected, the rotations. If you have Powell playing the five, you're just, you're going to get torched. It's just not his strength. Well, and you're right. And so like uh, the defensive rating, for example, with Porzingis two years ago when he was with the Knicks or or whatever, I however long ago it was now, oh. it's, it's getting all confusing. But when he was a full-time starter and he was the protector of the rim. <laughs> that sounds so official. He was the guy. The protector. of His net rating, defensive net rating was 106.7. This year... He's 109.4. But no, I mean, that is that is still the point that he is, yeah. even with his injury and everything, he is still a very good defender. It's, but again, yeah. if you have Dwight Powell, who's this, it's just not his strength, you know, and, and he does everything right. He he gets in a stance. He's he's there at the basket. He meets them. He goes straight up. He it, I feel like he doesn't foul very often. I mean, he is there doing the job, but it's like he's not even there. It's like guys just... They scoop it up around him or they just go in over him. I mean, it's like he's not even there. And so, yeah, yeah they're they're going to struggle on defense. And again, it's like you said with Porzingis, if he played the five or whatever it takes to get him down to where he's guarding the paint more, I think that would help your defense because that is his strength. Like, again, like just play to guys' strengths. Like I was saying with the shots, you have your two worst three-point shooters taking 10 three-pointers a game that's not playing to their strength with Porzingis he's one of your best defenders Powell is not a good interior defender and yet you have them reversed Powell is playing the the interior stopper it's like you're not playing to these guys strengths which I know is something Carlisle cares so much about he talks about that a Mm -hmm. lot and so it's like it's the, the rotations the offense um the the role the shots that guys are getting it's like Everything is is there. The system is there, but it's not the right players. Mm-hmm. It's not the right... The rotation yeah. just isn't right. And I, I believe Carlisle will figure that out. Um, it's just... It it's just frustrating. Yeah, because... Yeah. You know, He's going to try everything else besides the what ob- is obvious. Yeah, that's yeah. 100% And that's true. why it takes him so... That's why it takes the Mavs so long to to find their rhythm because... The first 20 games of the season is just a it's just a throwaway because you're gonna experiment with all this other weird crap that doesn't always make sense and doesn't always work until you're finally like, okay, fine, we'll just give the ball to Luca. Yeah. You know, like last year, it's like finally Jay, they just they gave the ball to Luca and we they had, let him run it. And it was awesome. And like against the the Knicks last year at home. The one where you embarrassed yes. us. The closing game, it was or closing the game, it was uh, Wes Matthews with the ball in his hands. And it was mm-hmm. just like, w- what are we doing? You know, yeah. like... It was like post-up after post-up, yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, these are five things um, that they have really got to figure out. And I don't think it's impossible. The only one I think that is difficult is their role players. I mean, these are the guys that they have. And, like, there's things that they can tweak. But ultimately, this is the roster that they have. But I think... If you move things around a little bit, if you find a way to get Porzingis involved, you know, maybe get some other guys in there, maybe play Berea more, maybe start DeLon Wright. Like, I think there's adjustments they can make to fix it. It's just, it's maddening to see (laughs) the same thing over and over. So, yeah, that's the Mavericks right now. Um, They have a lot to figure out. I think they have some quality pieces. They have some pieces that I think should be on the bench and not necessarily starting but you know like not that they shouldn't be playing they have some at all pieces that should be <laughs> on, on the, the bench, bench. Yeah. but you know that's those are the problems that that i think they should fix um and we'll see we'll see what carlisle does that's the episode let us know what you think about these um 
the offense, the defense, the rotations. Send us a message on Twitter, again, at Dallas Hoopscast. I'm at underscore Sydney Myers. Martin is at Martin L. Myers. They play the Raptors next, so um, I'm not feeling too confident about that game, but, you know, we'll see. And then after that, it's what the Spurs, Warriors, and Cavs. So, I mean, these next two games will be tough, but after that... And I don't even know if you can say this. Well, the the way the Mavericks are playing right now, every game is tough. Yeah, so... Anyways, thank you guys so much for listening. Let us know what you think about those things. Hopefully the Mavs turn it around and this season becomes fun again. (laughs) Thanks, guys, for listening. And uh, You we'll said see- that like nine times. Because I really appreciate them listening. <laughs> we'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye.